Welcome to Artificiality, brought to you by the founders of Sonder Studio. Artificiality is a podcast dedicated to understanding the emerging community that is humans and machines. We take the latest in the human side, decision science, psychology, and design, and put it together with advances in artificial intelligence and big data so that you can understand how to work better with machines and your fellow humans. We founded Sonder Studio to help people be more human in the age of AI. We're on this learning journey too, so we strive to find the frontiers, to ask the best questions, and stay curious. We interview some of the top minds working at the intersection of humans and machines and make sure we have a few laughs along the way. If you enjoy our podcasts, please subscribe and leave a positive rating or comment. Sharing your positive feedback helps us reach more people and connect them with the world's great minds. How should we respond and react to artificial intelligence and its impact on the world and each other? How should we handle the risk and uncertainty caused by the permeation of AI throughout our lives? To tackle these questions, we talked with Gerd Gigerinzer about his recent book, How to Stay Smart in a Smart World. We talk with Gerd about the impacts of big data on making decisions, the increasing use of AI for surveillance, the risks of trusting smart technology too much, and the broader impact of technology on our human dignity. Garrett is the Director Emeritus at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development and the author of several books, including Calculated Risks, Gut Feelings, and Risk Savvy, and the co-editor of Better Doctors, Better Patients, Better Decisions, and Classification in the Wild. He has trained judges, physicians, and managers in decision-making and understanding risk. We thoroughly enjoyed Garrett's book, and recommend it to both those new to AI who may be looking for an approachable introduction and to those expert in AI who may be looking for a new perspective to think about the future of our digital world. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. We're really excited to, uh, to talk with you today. I'm glad to be with you. Let's start off with a, a question of um, what inspired you to write this book? Now, I'm a psychologist by training and also have studied statistics. And I have been doing research for many years about how people deal with risk and uncertainty. And the topic of AI is a topic about humans, not so much algorithms. It's people who are in face or afraid It's people who don't understand what algorithms can do. And it's people behind the algorithms. So young, a handful of young, um, mostly men, uh, who don't want to pay taxes. And others who have faced that finally immortality will be able. So it's a huge interesting mixture of emotions and feelings behind AI. Couldn't agree with you more on that one. <laughs> and part of our uh, inspiration is is the kind of thinking that, that you've expressed and in this book as well. This is why we asked you about what inspired you because um, it as I, as I read through your work, I had this sense of sort of common view about um, the real risks of AI, the real risks of AI being that we talk about things um, – that we don't talk about enough about the things that really matter, which is uh, how people either um, don't use AI because they're scared or intimidated or don't understand it, or overuse AI because it looks like the best answer or the sexiest answer the magical or answer. the magical answer, yeah. <laughs> whatever those things are. And um, I thought that... You knew that the almost the the premise of your book was um, that struck me was about uh, trying to understand that this is really about grappling with uncertainty. Yeah, and 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 how we do that as humans. Mm. That's why the title is "How to Stay Smart in a Smart World." So it's about people, and much of what we hear and read about robots to take over the world, about singularity, 
about being replaced by algorithms is a distraction from the real issues. There will be no singularity in our lives. And there will be no robots who are smarter than we. And also Google will not be no us better than we do. And it's marketing hype. And AI can do immensely impressive things. But we need to understand what it can. It can't do everything. It's not another god. And some of the things that uh, are really uh, important, at least where I feel deeply involved and which might cause some uh, sleepless nights to some people I know, <laughs> uh, that we are sleepwalking into surveillance is a big issue. And that the convenience of digital technology changes our entire value systems. So ideas like privacy, uh, data protection, dignity, and even the very idea to take your life in your own hands is somehow being pushed away. And we are told that algorithms can do better, they know us better, they will make better decisions. And so we should just surrender and defer to what Alexa or the super intelligence allegedly coming out of Alexa will tell us. And what you will tell us will be something that's useful for tech companies, not necessarily for us. Let's just go back a little bit to um, part of one of the things that, that comes out a lot in your book is um, the, it's almost an ode to simplicity, um, to picking up where simple ways of thinking and simple ways of making decisions yeah. work well. Yeah. And setting aside that algorithms can, you know, AI can, can lack transparency and, and all of those kinds of things, can you talk a little bit about um, the, the, your thesis around sort of simple ways of doing things, that, heuristics that work yeah. mm -hmm. compared with big data? So I have been for many years leading a research group looking into what we call simple heuristics that make us smart. So heuristics are simple rules, like uh, just look at one or two or three of the most important variables, and that's it. And under uncertainty, you're not getting and gaining very much if you are just trying to integrate all kind of data. So one of the key propositions of the book is the stable world principle, which means that if you have a situation but tomorrow is like yesterday, where the rules are set, like chess and go. Their AI, so precisely deep neural artificial networks, will outperform us. That's no question. And that's the use of AI in the situation in industry and other things. But even then, so uh, Alpha Go or Alpha Zero, who beats every human in chess or go does not know that it's playing a game called chess or go, nor even that there's a human on the other side. So that's a difference between performance and understanding. On the other side, problems which have to do with uncertainty are such as having to do with people or even just viruses and predicting their course. Huh? They, uh, we, we know that from uh, uh, research in statistics and elsewhere, that here with big data, you're not getting very far because big data is like a large tanker huh? that you, uh, you uh, can't steer very well if the future is different. So in this situation, we need simple algorithms or simple rules and that's the, basically what humans do anyhow in making decisions under uncertainty. And we live in a society where the belief is that more data would be always better. That's true if you have to do with a stable world. In astronomy, wonderful. Yeah? 
but not when you predict human behavior. And that's uh, one of the insights. So if someone tells you that we can predict where the children get in trouble, so children at age six, where they will be trouble in, in, at age 12, and already send social workers to the parents to prevent that, then that's movies. That's science fiction. And this is not science, or it's marketing. But if someone tells you there will be soon a machine, much better than Alpha Zero, uh, which can do all two-person games better than humans, that's likely to happen. And every technology has its use and its limits, and that's the same with deep neural networks. So that's one of the insights. Another insight of the book is um, the adapt to AI principle, which means AI is not just an assistance system you know, that helps you to drive better or to uh, shop, <laughs> uh, but it changes you in a way that that we adapt to the technology and also its limits. So, for instance, um, Elon Musk still uh, claims every year that next year there will be a level five self-driving cars on the road. There won't be any level five self-driving cars on the road in Elon Musk's life. And he will soon uh, probably announce that he is going to build level three and level four cars. What does it mean? So the self-driving car is level five. That means a car that can drive without any human assistance safely under all conditions, there's no such car exists. Level four is the much more interesting version. Namely, it's a car that can drive without human assistance, but only in very restricted areas. And that's which may happen. And it's much more fundamental than having a nice car and leaning back and reading the New York Times in the car. That's not very interesting. But level four means that we have to adapt. We have to create cities where in parts of the cities, no human driver is allowed, where pedestrians and cyclists and everyone else is shielded off by walls or whatever so that the, um, the autonomous cars can actually drive safely. So that will change all of us. And maybe at some points, humans will be no longer allowed to drive behind the wheel. And just imagine if that would have already happened, people, and young people who don't remember that, may say, hmm, what a wild west, huh? where people could be behind the steering wheels and kill others. Now the world is much more safer. So that's just an example that... The real point is technology changes us. And it's not the first time. So the uh, in mid-19th century in Paris, before cars, traffic was so huge and so difficult. These were horses and horse carriages and pedestrians and everywhere that one tried to implement rules like uh, driving or walking or riding on the right side. That was enormously difficult to discipline people. And it was about as disciplined as, as they tried before to stop people from um, emptying their night pot through the window on the street. And so we are being disciplined by technology and it will happen again. And the only question is in what direction we are being disciplined. And whether we want that. Whether we're doing the disciplining or the machine is doing the disciplining of us, if you will. Yes, yes. It's, it's people. It's people who are doing the disciplining, yes. uh, but they use the machine yeah, for it. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to go back to the, the first um, point that you made about um, machines being 
so much better than us in AI in particular um, when there's a quantity of data that is predictive of the future. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, clearly. Um, and I'm curious about how you'd help people understand um, when the, that is the case. Meaning, uh, let's say, for instance, there's a business who's looking at using a uh, financial forecasting tool mm. that has an AI algorithm in it that looks at all the past performance and rolls out future performance. How can someone know that that actually is something they can rely on versus tomorrow, next year, two years from now, is just not going to be predictable enough because the company is selling products to consumers and consumer behavior, as you say, is it's people. And so it's, it's, yeah. it's unpredictable, but how do they know where, which side of those two things to, to fall on? There's always some uncertainty about that, hmm? but there are clear examples. So, uh, astronomy is one. So the behavior of the heavenly bodies is not disturbed really by us. But at the moment, humans are involved. And then it's very differently. And in finance, predictions, humans are involved. And the, the mathematical models that had been used before the last financial crisis did not recognize it, nor prevent it. On the contrary, they provided illusions of certainty until, as you may remember, it's just till uh, shortly before it happened in 2008, uh, the uh, volatility estimates just uh, provided more and more confidence. And that's called the Turkey illusion. The Turkey illusion is if one uh, confuses a certain of uncertainty, with one of calculable risk. Do you know why it's called a turkey illusion? No. Because you're the turkey? Yeah, as, assume you are the turkey. <laughs> you're a turkey. It's the first day of your, uh, of your life. A man comes in and you fear he will kill me, but he feeds you. Second day of your life, a man comes in again and you think he will kill me. No, he feeds you. Third day, the same thing. By all standard mathematical models like Bayesian probability updating, the probability that he will feed you and not kill you gets higher every day a bit. And on day 100, it's higher than ever before, but it's the day before Thanksgiving and you're dead meat. So <laughs> that's the problem of these algorithms. And that's the same with big data. So if there's uncertainty, if you think you are in a world of calculable risk, a stable world, then uh, that may be a turkey illusion. In general, uh, situations that involve the prediction of a people's behavior, that also involve the prediction of uh, the spread of flu, like uh, what Google tried with Google flu trends, huh? didn't work. And uh, also, many of these predictions who are highlighted uh, by the media and uh, that are about uh, emotional conta contagion, contagion, so like uh, uh, what Facebook tried, the effects are minimal if they are there. It's a very hard problem. So in this world, we usually can use very simple rules that are as good, but they are transparent and they don't cost fortunes and you don't need uh, huge amounts of energy and electricity to run your models. So one example is uh, recidivism prediction. So you stay in trial and now the question is whether you should be granted bail or not. And then there are algorithms uh, like Compass who uh, give you a risk score, basically predict whether you will uh, commit another crime in the next two years if you would be released on bail. And the studies that we have show clearly that these algorithms, which are typically industry, uh, uh, so commercial algorithms, intransparent, uh, are not better than very simple rules, like just look at previous convictions, and age, and maybe gender. 
so young male and previous convictions, then you are basically done. It cannot be beaten by these complex algorithms. But judges uh, usually have no statistical training. So I have trained in the U.S. federal judges and also taught at law schools, and I think it was one of the only times, one of the few only times where someone taught statistical thinking, they do not understand that typically, a lot trained. Yeah? And if there's a crystal uh, ball that they don't understand, so at least some will take, oh, it must be good. If there's a simple rule, if the person is between 18 and 22 male and has more than two previous convictions, then yeah, it's likely that the person... Uh, will reoffend. Yeah, that looks too simple. But it only looks too simple if one doesn't understand that we cannot really predict very well the future, and that's what we can do. And we don't need crystal balls and secret algorithms that pretend they could do better. So, do you think that um, that the Machines and AI, and part of actually bringing these, um, bringing AI and big data into a workflow like the one you just described, is it actually contributing to uncertainty? Is it in contributing to complexity because you've got this additional, if you like, we call them machine employees, um, where there's a different type of false positive or a different type of false negative. Um, and there's also the complexity of people sort of second-guessing the algorithm or following the algorithm, whatever those things are. There's, it, it seems like there's an additional layer of complexity coming in simply because there's another decision-making party. Yeah. So what I think is that um, we need to educate people about the kind of questions they need to ask when they hear about an algorithm can do face recognition, for instance, in train stations. And uh, my experience is that the simple questions that you just referred to, what is the false positive rate? What is the hit rate of an algorithm? That quite few politicians and policymakers understand what questions they need to ask. So in my experience with politicians, uh, the statistical, so if you want to understand AI, you need to uh, know something about IT and about statistics. Or you need a good common sense to just ask the questions that everyone should ask. So my experience is that uh, very few policymakers really know the, uh, what questions to ask. Here's one example. The uh, Not far away, where I live in Berlin, it's not far away where I live, there was a, uh, a terrorist attack a few years ago. And uh, it was a deadly terrorist attack. And the, uh, the German Minister of the Interior uh, thought, why not to have a surveillance system? that uh, uses face recognition cameras, is installed on all uh, uh, train stations in Germany, and then would pick out hmm, the suspects. And so they ran this uh, trial for a year and then came up with two numbers. The two numbers were the system detects 80% of the suspects they were played by yeah, people. And it has a false alarm rate of only one in thousand. And the Minister of Interior thought, that's fabulous. Now we roll out the inter program, the old the entire program in Germany, put on face recognition systems everywhere, and on it goes. Now, what uh, he and his advisors had not thought about is something that's quite simple, namely, so we have about 12 million people every day in train stations, okay? And there are maybe 600 suspects that bosses. So 
good. You, you likely get these suspects at some point, but you will have every day hmm, uh, with a false alarm rate of one in thousand. That means out of 12 million, 12,000 uh, innocent people that are stopped, held, that are uh, uh, checked and uh, and kept until their identity is proven. So that would mean not more the security or safety, but the police forces would be occupied with innocent people and not be able to do their job anymore. That's a simple thought. And uh, to get this thought into several politicians' minds proved to be quite difficult. And the solution would be very simple. We could start in school to teach young people, adolescents, hmm, that you need to ask two questions for every algorithm. Yeah? What is its false positive rate? And what is its hit rate? And then you look at the base rate. Huh? There are 12 million, and then you get the idea. That doesn't work. And also, face recognition systems work in other situations. So if you open your uh, smartphone with your face, that's a situation it can do, because it's usually you and the photos stored in your smartphone. So it's one-to-one, -one. whereas in, in surveillance, in mass surveillance, it is thousands or millions of people against 100,000 in some kind of uh, a data bank of suspects. And these distinctions are not so difficult to learn. And they're at the beginning of making people smart so that they can take the remote control of their lives back into their own hands. It's a lot of what you're talking about is, um, you know, people who have, you know, studied statistics would go, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know, I get that, I understand that. But if you haven't had much education in statistics, then thinking probabilistically and even thinking about the one that you just mentioned, which is essentially that the false positive rate across a large mm -hmm. number outstrips the true positive rate of the small number. You know, it's just yeah. there's just that yeah. many more people in that in that in that sample. And how, when it comes to sort of helping people think probabilistically, or even getting them over the hump of what it means to think probabilistically, um, how do you go through that process? What do you think are the most important things that you, as a as a teacher, that you know someone kind of gets it? Yeah. That they have that. Oh, I see now. I, I see how to flip that around, yeah. or, or I see how to how to to factor in that uncertainty in the decision I'm making. So it's very important to teach statistical thinking by example, not as a mathematical discipline. So, for instance, the uh, uh, how to illustrate the idea of false positives. So, uh, for instance, if a pregnancy test has a false positive rate of 1 in 100, meaning that out of 100 women who are not pregnant, one uh, gets nevertheless a positive result, how can I illustrate it? You need to use something that sticks in people's mind. So, what we do is now we have 1,000 men, hmm? and we do the pregnancy test on 1,000 men, so we might expect 10 of them have a positive pregnancy result. So you get the idea of, of what false positives are. And that they are not, uh, and no test is certain. Every test can make one of two errors. And, and by teaching, by example, uh, having, and, and statistics, so, which is the science of, of risk and uncertainty is one of the most interesting parts or at least relevant parts of mathematics. But we teach our kids the mathematics of certainty, algebra, geometry, which doesn't help you very much in understanding AI. We need to change that. We need to teach uh, uh, how to deal with uncertainty. And then also at another level, uh, so the question that you posed before, hmm, how do we know? Whether it is a stable world or a non-stable, there's also some degree of uncertainty about that. 
we need to learn to live with uncertainty, may even enjoy uncertainty. It's interesting, not something well, that to be was avoided. teeing into my next question. <laughs> that was teeing into my next question, which is, how, how, I mean, we don't like it. It feels uncomfortable. Uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. As a as a um, psychologist, two parts of this question: Can you explain why we don't like uncertainty, and then how best to like how do you feel comfortable with uncertainty? What 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 are the strategies that you see actually work? Is it about mastering statistics and not having it be such a wide open? fearful thing or um, is it are there you know putting numbers on it that gives people a handle on things or is it thinking how not to be how, how to be less wrong for example thinking about how to improve from the bottom up what what are these sort of strategies that you think matter so um, imagine a world where everything would be certain there's no uncertainty we would know what happens tomorrow we would know what happens in a year. Uh, we would know who is betraying us and whom, who is a real friend. That would be fine. But look, life would be as boring as reading the newspapers of last year. And also, everything that makes us human different from an algorithm, like emotions, trust, uh, hope, disappointment would no longer be possible because we know everything. So I say this because the fiction of a world where everything is predictable and certain is one of the worst things that can happen to us. And, and also, second, uh, there are many areas where people don't want to know. They want to be surprised or they don't want to hear the bad news. So I've done a study, uh, a representative study in Germany and in Spain, asking people, would you want to know when you die? 90% don't want to know. Or would you want to know of what you die? Same result. Or would you want to know if you're married, whether your marriage will end in divorce? No, don't want to know. And there are a few people who say, of course I want to know. I want to know everything. And, but it's only 1% of the population who wants to know everything. And, and you can understand that. And it's, it's what makes us humans. We, we have to live in uncertainty. And if, you want to, if you're a man and uh, think about, uh, given a man, for instance, can never be really sure whether he is the biological father of his children. And when we asked unmarried men whether they would want to find out or would actually find out with a DNA test, which is very simple, 40% of them said, I want to know. When we asked men who were married and had children whether they actually did do a DNA test, it's only 4%. And you can understand why. Because uh, if they would learn the worst result, they would be worse off as they are without knowing. And so it's also a human affair about uh, some things to know and something not to know. And, and, uh, and also, for instance, games and and sports, it's all about uncertainty, enjoying uncertainty. You don't want to know what the outcome of a soccer game or a football game is in advance. You want to live and have the suspension. So, uh, and, and then there is the illusion of certainty. As Benjamin Franklin said, there's nothing certain in this world as besides death and taxes. So we should basically also do something to teach our youth to live with uncertainty, to accept it rather than to deny it. I'm having one, one of those well, well, duh moments about um, how, uh, you know, a lot of our most joyful emotions actually come from 
surprise. Living and uh, uncertainty. Yeah. And uh, read a really interesting book recently by a philosopher in, in the US who he wrote a, a short book about um, on the philosophy of death and mortality. And the certainty of knowing that you will die versus the uncertainty of n- not knowing where that, when that will happen and how that will happen. And this, that, that, that is it's a short book that goes through in brilliant philosophical logic where you think that the argument has ended but it keeps getting unpicked even further about how that actually does um, define every moment that we actually live because we're always in this fragile state of, of not knowing, and that drives us to, to do different things. It drives us to seek meaning and all those kinds of things. But it was it's kind of a fascinating exploration through the ultimate uncertainty versus certainty argument. And it kind of left me wondering, well, you know, if an AI could predict exactly when and how you were going to die, how would that change your decisions? And... Um, I haven't obviously answered that yet. It's one of those rhetorical questions. <laughs> and thanks God he can't. <laughs> and there's no way to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But but the, the connection is there. So there is it's, at least some of philosophers, but also proponents of AI, they see that the old dream of immortality can now be delivered by somehow this mystical superintelligence uh, where we c- can upload our brains. So in the cloud of superintelligence. And, uh, and you can see how uh, dreams that some people have dreamt for centuries are coming back with any new technology. And there's just think for a moment, if there would be really a superintelligence which will not be there, <laughs> well, we can talk about that, why not? Uh, what interest would the superintelligence have to have, have our stupid brains being uploaded? Yeah. Um, but the dream just precludes thinking. <laughs> and, and it just goes on. And singularity is then the, 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 the big word for, for all of that. By the way, um, not all people really want to live forever. I've just done a survey uh, and among the Germans, only 23% say they would like to live forever if it would be medically possible. The rest, no. And you can guess whether it's more the young ones or the old ones. So it, um, it's uh, higher uh, among over 30% among the young ones. But the older people get, the more birthdays they have lived through. Hmm? the less is the motivation to do this forever. It might be, uh, I, would, I could imagine that that is also based on their state of life, that someone who's 30 says, oh, I'll be 30 forever. Yeah. But someone who gets to be 50 or 70 or 90 goes, I'm not sure I want to be this forever. You know, This is a different decline. So, but a, a thread to pull a little bit on, on this question of uncertainty and using AI in that one of, the, one of the key advantages of uh, unsupervised learning, right, when we present AI, I'll be very sim- you know, simplistic, just as you present AI with a huge amount of data and see what the AI can discover within the data and provide us with models and predictions, that one of those pre- the premises there is that the AI can find patterns that we don't see in data, that we can't comprehend. It can look in this vastness of hyperspace and dimensions of data that we can't understand. And that presents a prediction. And if it's designed at least somewhat well, it has some level of confidence in that prediction. I'm 95% confident that this is the answer, which highlights a a level of uncertainty because there's obviously 5% chance that it's wrong, at least in its mind. Um, But then also we have no ability to actually query that in a way to truly understand. I'm not just saying that it's not transparent. I'm saying it's looking at data that we can't, we don't understand how it's coming up with the answer. One of the, the great examples that we, we, we enjoy is the one from uh, DeepMind, where they created an algorithm that could um, predict the sex of a person based on an analysis of the retina. And it is 
very highly accurate, 97% accurate, I think, was the, was the research study. But even the researchers don't understand how the AI is doing it. They don't understand what data it's seeing in the well, retina. To no be able to human predict. expert has ever done anything other than a coin toss. Yeah, no human expert has ever been able to dis- determine the sex of a person by looking at their retina. So we have this thing where we know that research says it's 97% accurate, which means 3% is wrong, but we don't really understand. It just feels like we're layering more levels of uncertainty based on the fact that AI is able to analyze a quantity of data that we can't not get a level of certainty on because we don't understand it. It's beyond our level of comprehension. No, Dave, remember the stable world principle. If, if the situation yeah. is a stable one, then that may actually happen that the AI is better than a human. And uh, so we have some uh, good data for uh, skin cancer detection, where the AI seems to be doing at the level of experienced doctors. But again, it's a problem where the skin cancers are all somehow similar, and the AI will find some patterns that are characteristic. And if that's not the case, then the AI will find some spurious correlations. And uh, many of the successes in other, in unstable worlds have later been shown that the AI has found something that has nothing to do with the problem. Uh, And then uh, has made good predictions, but only on the data set where it was trained and tested. And that is an important distinction to keep apart. And also that the, um, a, uh, so if we talk about artificial uh, uh, deep learning, then we are talking about neural networks that learn association. If it's about pictures, then between pixels or between groups of pixels. That's what it does. It's very different from a human. So if I show a three-year-old a giraffe, I may have to do it another time. Then it understands what it is. But uh, deep learning needs 10,000 or more of pictures of giraffes or of buses, school buses, to recognize one. So it's a very different kind of learning. Why? Because it's a, a deep learning is a statistical machine that has many, many free parameters that it has to adjust and weigh in order to get a result that's totally different from human uh, intelligence. The human intelligence has a, uh, already a little kid has a concept of a school bus, an American school bus, yellow and with black corners. And even uh, deep neural networks who are well trained to recognize school buses from other objects on the street, they have no concept of a school bus. They just can do it. And there are adversarial algorithms who try to find out where it can be fooled, the deep neural network. And in my book, I have shown a few pictures where you can see that, uh, for instance, a deep neural network that has learned to detect school buses on pictures 100% correctly, and then it's given a picture that has just horizontal stripes, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, and it thinks it's 99% Sure, it's a school bus. So that the, in, in this experiment, you get some idea of what's going on. Obviously, in this case, it has been colors. And if the colors are repeated many, many times, it gets ever sure that it's a thing. But it also shows you it's a very different kind of learning. And uh, what we associate with human intelligence understanding, causal thinking, or having an intuitive psychology, we do not know how to get this in a deep neural network. 
that may not be our goal. Yeah, I think it's a wrong idea to try to make the uh, deep neural networks like humans. So they can do certain things we cannot do. So even language translation models who do not understand language, but they can translate in hundred languages. No human can ever do this, and in a in a blink. And that I do not understand languages, I don't know if you've seen the recent post by Douglas Hofstetter, known as from Gödel Escher Bach, and he has looked at GPT three, so one of the yeah uh, recent hailed. Networks, there are so many more free parameters in the millions or billions than previous ones like BERT. And as long as you ask questions that are yeah, friendly and nicely, it can produce amazing text. But Hofstede asked the following question. When was Egypt the second time transported over the Golden Gate Bridge. Hmm. So when was Egypt the second time transported over the Gate, Gate Bridge? And the GPT-3 found the answer. It was the 16th or the 17th of November 2017. Hmm. So, yeah, it cannot think. It doesn't recognize that the question makes no sense. It associates, finds something that has to do with Golden Gate Bridge and Egypt, and finds this November date. And we can then figure out what it is. But the point is, it is an excellent system, but it cannot understand. It cannot, it doesn't understand a question that makes no sense. And it also doesn't understand that its answer makes no sense. Still, it's a good translation system. And we need to keep that these things apart. And that's also why we will need humans for a very long time. When people work with really big data sets and AI for the first time, at what point do you really encourage people to step back and develop a, a greater sense of, of what the problem is they're trying to solve or the question is they're trying to solve or what the causal model is or something that is meaningful and sense-making for humans as opposed to what could be this gold mine of big data? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, AI once was the idea that you analyze how humans uh, think, so the heuristic process in humans, and program them into computers to make computers smart. That was the original idea, Herbert Simon, Alan Newell, and others. Now with machine learning, in the last 10 years, uh, Many of my machine learning colleagues, they think that psychology is totally irrelevant for what they do. It's just statistics, like many statisticians also thought or still think. And then they can just have a data set, and the bigger the better, divide it in two halves, and teach uh, the machine on one and test it on the other one. That's the idea. And then you do a competition and see which one does better. Uh, in my opinion, again, that works for problems uh, that are of the type of a stable world, like chess, gas industry uh, applications and many others. But it will not help you to make progress in an uncertain world. The human mind evolved to deal not with a stable world but with an uncertain world. Or statisticians would say with risk, calculable risk, not with death, but with uncertainty. And the um, we have in the social sciences, even among scientists, an anxiety to deal with uncertainty. So decision theory is almost all about situations of calculable risk where you know everything including the probability distributions. And most of economics re reduces every problem to one, to a lottery, where you know everything. And uh, even behavioral economics, who is su supposedly criticizes uh, economics, takes the same standard uh, of what's right in a world of calculable risk. And when people's intuition deviate, the blame is 
never on the theory, it's always on us. So there's a kind of war against human intuition, which is needed in a world of uncertainty, including experience and all the emotions, everything, and the social nature of our beings. So here is a, a larger societal process behind that, that we dream of that the world would be predictable, and then <clears throat> let's see what rational behavior would be in this world. And that avoids <clears throat> to realize that most of the things we do is unpredictable or only predictable to some degree, and we need to find a way to deal rationally with uncertainty. And that's what most of us do anyhow. We use simple heuristics. We trust people. We rely on recognition. And we have uh, lots of other tools to deal with our lives. So we ask others for advice. None of that is a tool that an algorithm uses. If I could loop back earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned the word dignity. And um, we love that word actually in this context. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean about the challenge to dignity in today's smart world, I'm using air quotes, um, and also what the potential future might be yeah. for <clears throat> our own human dignity. Mm. So um, one area where uh, we are losing dignity is in surveillance. So by giving away uh, to our own decision uh, to algorithms and also to people behind the algorithms, really, and, uh, and letting them make our decisions in uh, either the, with the idea that, oh, these algorithms are so much smarter than us, so we believe that, or it's just convenient not to make decisions anymore ourselves. And I think that one of the key features of human dignity is the opposite of paternalism. So I don't let others make the decisions. And even worse, I don't agree to that. Yeah. So, uh, and we, we know from, from uh, so we are now in a situation where uh, people buy smart houses. I mean, a smart house has very little extra convenience hmm? for some people. Yeah, You may be able to, to switch on your heating while you're driving already, or uh, when you get up, you're a smart coffee machine. But it is basically a spy that records everything you do, you say. And most of the time, for reasons for uh, selling for advertisers, but as we know from Snowden and others, the link between governments and tech industry is much closer than most people think. So it starts with this kind of little technology that we surrender. Then we do have already in, uh, in, the, in the children's rooms spyware built in. So remember um, Barbie doll. So the first Barbie doll was just was built after a German tabloid for men, and it uh, gave uh, quite a few little girls uh, a few about themselves as just having the wrong body, violating their own perception of their own little dignity. The second version of Barbie could talk in 1998, a few sentences, such as, math is hard, let's go shopping. So gave little girl the idea, not only have, do they have the wrong body shape, but also they're not up to what men are for. And the Hello Barbie from 2015 could actually conduct a conversation with the little girl and uh, also recorded all the conversation and send it to third parties who analyze it 
for uh, yeah, reasons of advertising. And also, uh, the parents could pay to get a daily or weekly record of what the secrets the little girl uh, trusted to their beloved doll. Now, talking about dignity. Um, so when the little girl will finally find out hmm, that it has been spied on and the parents paid for the spying, it may lose trust in the parents and its beloved doll. But here, something even more interesting can happen. Namely, she adapts. And she grows up in a world where being spied on is normal. Being surveilled 24-7 is what else could the world be about? And it takes it's just seriously. And also, uh, the conversation that Hello Barbie can conduct uh, are based on the recordings. And it will conduct uh, conversations about products to sell and to buy, uh, about clothing, and about other things the advertisers are interested and in pay Mattel for that. And here's another issue that worries me. So children develop their creativity and by playing with, with toys, and it's not only girls, it's boys, yeah, and have a fantasy that they can develop. And the moment these toys steer the conversation to products to be sold and to the interest of companies behind that, huh? that fant a fantasy and that creativity will be yeah, hampered or destroyed. I will finish with a, a question about um, your recommendations. Um, what, if you were to give a couple or a few recommendations of books to read, movies to watch, TV to watch, podcasts to listen to, for our listeners who are interested in what you've written and how you think, what, where would you point them for more inspiration? So if you uh, want to know something that is close to AI, statistics, then read the history. I always found this so much more enlightening than read a book that has no history. So Ian Hacking is a great author. He has written several books. Or Lorraine Daston, who happens to be my wife, I have to disclose that, <laughs> has also written brilliant books about what happened in the 19th or 18th century to today with this dream of a general algorithm that's at the end of statistical. If you, uh, what I also like to read is, uh, so the book with the big ideas, and there are some classics. For instance, uh, in sociology, there are two books that I found so fascinating. One also is Norbert Elias. Uh, so he, uh, his book is the civil, called The Civilization Process. Civilization Process, how we became yeah, uh, a civilized people. We started to eat with forks and knives, not with the hands and grabbing it. And how all of this, including our emotions, have been shaped from outside. It just opens your eyes. It just gives you one example. So shame. If we would conduct this interview naked, every one of us would be ashamed. Not so in the past. So uh, Louis XIV, so the, the French king, huh, used to have the meetings with the ambassadors of other countries when he got up from bed and naked, sitting on the pot. He was not ashamed of those people. But the other way around, it would be an insult to the king. So shame was asymmetric. It was a sign of you being inferior. You can think about that 
that people today wouldn't be ashamed being naked in front of a dog. That's about how he was thinking. But it gives you an idea about how the deepest feelings that we have are a function, in his case, of democratization of society, where everyone became more equal and also emotions became symmetric. So that's, that's a, another example of what, the, what I think are the big books where you understand your own uh, psyche a little bit better and get rid of the illusion that you determined everything yourself, what you feel. Hmm? But that gives you then a chance to finally start your own life. Excellent. Those are wonderful recommendations. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. This has been a great pleasure. Um, we very much enjoyed your book and highly recommend people read it. Yeah, and stay smart. Yes, and, and stay keep smart. thinking. That's thank the you. most important thing to do in a modern technological world. So, bye bye. <laughs> Stay